Welcome everybody and thank you for coming uh, to our final lecture in this year's core lecture series. Um, I'm going to pass the virtual mic to our own Jessica Handler, who will introduce tonight's speaker. Um, and today's speaker came at the recommendation of Professor Handler, who is a professor, the professor in our writing program, and <laughs> who has written two nonfiction books, um, including a memoir, and then recent, most recently, a novel that, as far as I can tell, continues to garner awards every time I check Instagram, um, The Magnetic Girl. So um, we, if you've, if you've attended the lecture series um, all year, you'll know we've been trying to pick lectures that uh, plug into the core broadly, but sort of are trying to encompass sort of the scope of our gen ed program. So we've heard from mathematicians who use math to talk about um, racial profiling and policing. We've, we've heard from a scholar of W.B. Du Bois. Um, and then most recently, the student choice of speaker was uh, a trans activist who's local to Atlanta talking about sort of activism. And then we wanted our final talk to sort of bridge from um, activism into thinking about the connections between art and the creation of art and activism. And so our speaker tonight is going to talk about, well, something involving narrative, which will sound familiar uh, to those who have gone through the core from the beginning. So um, I'll turn things over to you, Jessica, and thanks everyone for coming. Thank you, Dr. Terry, and thanks y'all for coming. So hello, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us for this final core lecture series for the semester. I am delighted to introduce you to our speaker, Jennifer Baker. Jennifer is a publishing professional of almost 20 years, the creator and host of the Minorities in Publishing podcast, and a faculty member of the MFA program in creative nonfiction at Bay Path University. In 2019, she was named Publishers Weekly Superstar for her contributions to inclusion and representation in publishing. Jennifer is also the editor of the BIPOC short story anthology, Everyday People, The Color of Life, from which I have taught, and the author of the forthcoming novel, Forgive Me Not. Her fiction, nonfiction, and criticism have appeared in various print and online publications. You can find her on the web at jennifernbaker.com. Please welcome my friend, Jennifer Baker. Thank you so much for that introduction, Jessica. And thank you for having me, Sarah, and everybody. Um, happy spring, happy almost end of April, happy almost end of the semester. Very proud of all of us for what we've accomplished, even if it's just getting out of bed. That's, that's big in these times. So I'm gonna bless you with some PowerPoints because that's how I roll. <laughs> and I'm also a big proponent of the past and how important the past is to understanding our present and kind of seeing forth what the future is going to bring. So there will be some mini history coming in, but I, trust me, it all blends into the conversation at hand. I also wanna note that there's gonna be a couple videos and in one case, the one video is going to be about seven minutes, and that will have closed captions. Uh, the second one will be less than three minutes, so it's going to be about two-ish minutes. And that one sadly doesn't have closed captions, sorry to say, but it was a better video quality, so that's why I went with that one. So you will, you will kind of hear my voice <laughs> and, and see these slides. And, and also, I'm a New Yorker, born and raised, so I tend to talk fast, so I'm really trying to pace myself, <laughs> not do this, 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 this thing that is just very inherent to my people. <laughs> so so if, if I talk too fast or if there anything that at least chimes in, feel free to chime in or kind of bring it up at the end of something that I can talk about and you know bring back to the conversation. And again, Jennifer uses she, her pronouns. So I'm gonna start sharing the screen. So I'm hoping everyone can see. All righty. So first we're gonna define artivism and artivism is art meets activism. And by definition, artivism blends social justice, activism and art. 
And I believe the term has existed for over 20 years or so. And the practice is often taught to younger generations as well as utilized by groups aiming to broach and showcase more awareness on social justice issues with creative immersion. And so I have several friends who are artivists or teaching artists, and they do tend to meld art and activism when they talk to young people in terms of doing things like murals or conducting plays. And a lot of this is collective and you know, group work. So how are we defining art and activism when we separate the two, right? And so art by definition is different branches of creative activity, right? And that can be motion-based, it can be textual, it can be oral, et cetera. And, and there's no one definitive way to define art, but these are some examples. And same thing for activism. There's not necessarily one definitive way to look at activism, despite what you heard on Twitter. But it can include protests and voting, which I hope we all are registered to vote, and specialized nonprofits that aid in especially marginalized communities that aren't getting federal, state, or legislative aid. And then we have fundraising, petitions, strikes, boycotts. And for me, one of the most important things, and I, I really take this very much to heart, especially as an artist, is community building. And we're going to talk a little bit about that at the very end. And I, I welcome people's questions about that. But I feel like it's very, very, very important to what we're talking about when we think about activism, because we're serving community, and also art, because we're writing, or I'm writing, or we're creating for community, right? So the union of art and awareness is not new. Right, I mean, this goes back farther than we can imagine, especially when it comes to like preservation of cultural customs and general history. So these are two individuals who you may be very, very familiar with. The person on my right is Phyllis Wheatley and her name is even etched into the border in her portrait. The person on my left is Frederick Douglass and that's a, another portrait of him or photo of him. Both individuals were very well known for the time. Phyllis Wheatley, she was brought into slavery in 1761, and she would gain her freedom in 1774 when Susanna Wheatley died. And she is known to be the first African American poet to be published back in the 1700s. And Frederick Douglass, again on my left, he's known as a great orator, activist, and abolitionist. And he was born into slavery in 1818, and he would go on to escape in 1838. And he would escape to where I am currently, New York State. <clears throat> and he would actually send for the woman who would become his first wife, Anna Murray, and she was a free black woman at the time. And so also people may have read, maybe in an educational setting, maybe not in an educational setting, the narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass, his autobiography that was published in 1845. Uh, and that's like one of his most well-known works, obviously. And he talked very overtly about what it was like to be an ens enslaved black man and, and the violence and, and you know the danger that he, that he experienced and the danger of even learning to be able to become literate uh, and how that was extracted from the black community. And it was a tool of oppression of many other tools of oppression, right? So even in thinking of narratives of the self, how are we able to even express ourselves? And for a time, it was illegal to do that. It was absolutely not on the table for a lot of individuals. And so this also taps into the importance of us being able to express ourselves, us having the freedom to do that, and what kind of stories are we actually talking about, be they literal in the case of Douglas or symbolic in the case of Wheatley. And even in reading Wheatley's work, maybe it doesn't feel symbolic, even though it's poetry, maybe it feels also very literal to you. Case in point, we're going to read some Wheatley. <laughs> So this poem is published, I believe, 1773, and it's called On Being Brought from Africa to America, written by Phyllis Wheatley. And I'm gonna recite it. Twas mercy brought me from my pagan land, taught my benighted soul to understand that there's a God, that there's a savior too, 
once I redemption neither sought nor knew. Some view our sable race with scornful eye, their color is a diabolical dye. Remember Christians, Negroes, black as cane, may be refined and join the angelic train. So I, everyone's, uh, you know, how you wanna interpret that piece is I welcome the individual perspectives that you all wanna to bring to it. Um, but she is talking very openly about racism, right? And, and she makes a very declarative mention when she says, I'm being brought from Africa to America. You know, like she's, she's not mincing words. It's not kind of like a the metaphorical title. This is like a literal title. It's the most literal title you can get, right? And she's bringing in Christianity and what humanity means. And she also uses words like the pagan land and saviors and redemption and refined. And, and what does that all mean when in conjunction with one another? And, and, and what do you think? that she's trying to express here. To me, um, it is very openly about racism, but there's other elements here. It's not a simplistic way to, there's not a simplistic way to look at what Wheatley is saying here, especially of the time and, and, and of her experiences, which I can't speak for, right? Uh, but there's an importance to her being able to express herself and her to build a narrative that brings awareness to what her experience is, especially as someone who, has been given the opportunity to be literate, right? So when do art and activism intersect? And that is a big question. And because this is a lecture, it's kind of a rhetorical question, right? But that's really up to the artists. And in cases like Douglas and Wheatley, who cannot presently speak for themselves, what they thought and openly said about their work in many cases, they were, again, pretty literal about what that means and what that was for them. So I get into a little bit more history, friends. So we have a brief timeline and please, I am not a historian by nature, so, so but we are gonna get into some, some black history. Abolitionist movements, 1830 to 1870, again, Frederick Douglass's work, most known work, 1845, came about in that period. About late 1700s to, again, late 1800s, which falls into this period, a lot of slave narratives were being scribed, published, abolitionists were kind of promoting that work. It's not to say that that's the only time period that narratives by people who were enslaved were published. There would be more thereafter. But some of the ones that we might know the most that have been several times adapted, uh, that may, again, might be pretty steady part of the educational curriculum. Uh, those are ones that you probably saw during the abolitionist movement and even prior to that. Harlem Renaissance, which is one of my favorite artistic periods, 1918 to the 1930s. Um, we had so many great writers come of age of this time. Uh, one of my favorites, Zora Neale Hurston, and I'm so glad to be able to work at a place that you know, publishes her estate consistently. And so it's a big dream of mine to come to fruition. Uh, you know, but a lot of the people published during the Harlem Renaissance, you know, there were different camps. There are some who were just like, we need to talk about racism all the time. We need to talk about what's going on and, and talk about blackness in relation to whiteness. And there are people like, I, I'm not interested in that whatsoever. No, thank you. And so, you know, everyone was kind of contributing so many different things to the conversation. And there was a lot of elevation of black thought at that time and a lot of investment in black thought at that time. And this is like coming off of World War I, but we're still seeing Jim Crow laws and we're still seeing segregation. And also the great migration is happening around this time as well, right? So some of these stories kind of interweave these things, these larger social conversations into art in itself. So we don't necessarily you know, separate these two things. Sometimes they really do come together. Civil rights movement, 1950s to 1960s. Jazz age is also happening, keep that in mind prior and then during. And you know, we had people like Billie Holiday, Mahalia Jackson, Harry Belafonte, who, if they were not just using their music to speak to 
their experiences, again, narratives of the self, like how are they expressing themselves? They were also, if not were associated with many activists of the time, that they were actively marching and, and doing what they needed to do. And also having, being impeded on that too. Okay, sorry, someone's like buzzing my buzzer. I don't know why. So, <laughs> so thank you for that. Black arts movement, bam. <clears throat> Black power movement, 1960s to 1970s. So Black Panther Party founded about 1966. Black arts movement is kind of rumored to have started 1965 by Amory Baraka when he opened the Black Artists Repertory Theater in Harlem. And so there are a lot of wonderful people who thankfully we still have to this day, Nikki Giovanni, Sonia Sanchez, who are part of the Black Arts Movement, and, and you know, Baldwin, Gil Scott Haran, uh, Yusuf Aman, and other musicians and digital artists of the time too. So, you know, there again, you see Black Power Movement black arts movement when people are just like we're going to own our stories we're going to tell our stories and our stories might be very critical of what's happening in the world and it might be expressing my sexual identity my gender like what is what kind of expression do i want to kind of build in terms of again my community and what does that look like so all those things are coming into play The importance of having freedom of expression from Black artists and people reference really pushes against dominant narratives. And I'm going to use air quotes, dominant narratives. And those controlling a lot of the media that's minimizing other experiences while carrying over very problematic theories, right? And that includes the media. Case in point, Los Angeles Times. This may be a bit fuzzy, but you're going to see a bit you know, like firmer text in the next slide. Marauders from inner city prey on LA's suburbs. This was a headline in the LA Times, 1981. So I don't know if people saw, I'm, I'm a big on the Twitter yeah. for, you know, good or bad reasons, I'm, I'm big on the Twitter. But last year, September, the LA Times, they decided to reckon with an openly racist past. Writers contributed several pieces tackling specific discussions and articles and representations that appeared in the Times over the years. The editorial board collectively apologized and vowed to do better. From headlines to word choice to perspective, the ways in which national media have and continue to spin the stories around and about communities has had detrimental effects. And so, Folks may not categorize periodicals as art. You know, they, they might be like, no, this is like historical record. It's factual. It's not necessarily creative. Um, but, you know, for the sake of this conversation, let's kind of lump it in, depending on your thoughts on the matter. But it is still intuitive into how are we actually absorbing what's being discussed, especially if this is part of the record. So LA Times isn't the only periodical has done this, right? And it shows why the importance of these autobiographical accounts going back to Douglas and going back to Wheatley are critical for the historical record and preservation of, and the preservation of those whose lives may be dictated by those who are in power. So this is what the LA Times said in reflection of the inherent bias of this particular article. Marauders from inner city prey on LA suburbs, published by the LA Times on July 12th, 1981. We're starting in the middle of a sentence here. Described a permanent underclass in the city's ghettos and barrios, fueling a crime wave that was spilling over from South Los Angeles into prosperous and largely white communities in Pasadena, Palos Verdes, Beverly Hills, and elsewhere. The article purported to be an ambitious look at a major social problem, and it cited a lack of education and jobs as underlying causes of inner city distress. But it also reinforced pernicious stereotypes that Black and Latino Angelinos were thieves, rapists, and killers. So 
So the LA Times acknowledgement, it mirrors an attempt that the National Geographic, another very well-known publication, had made years ago when they cited offensive and ultimately racist depictions of communities worldwide. But even with the acknowledgement of the harm caused, there has to be additional critique, right? Along with more perspectives that are allowed to articulate realities not being conveyed. So once again, this circles back to the importance of the first person accounts, not the projections. The LA Times portrayed people as less than, they portrayed them as threats, and they portrayed them as reckless. And when these narratives are pervasive around marginalized communities, especially, emphasis on our narratives and the R in our narratives, they become even more crucial to build awareness. So how does art affect change and enact awareness? And that's another big question. And it's one with no singular answer. And when we consider how art works in all iterations, it can be inspiring, it can be illuminating, and it can be encouraging. And it can motivate people to learn more or those who didn't think it possible to relay their stories. It could provide more context uh, to short-sighted and biased accounts, such as those mentioned about in the LA Times. And it can also enact a larger understanding of how things could and should be. So I'm gonna switch it up. We're gonna watch a video. And I do wanna also note that the video I'm going to share, it may have some violent imagery. Um, and so if that is going to be triggering or concerning for you, I welcome you to kind of look away from the screen or kind of pop something up all over the screen rather than actually look at that imagery. Cause I can't tell you when it's gonna pop up. It just kind of pop, pops up sporadically uh, in, in the, the, sh the seven minutes that we're gonna watch. There's also closed caption. This is the one that has closed caption. Y'all can see I have my HBO Max account up, which is great for situations such as this. So you just saw a bit from Black Art in the Absence of Life. That's a documentary that's again on HBO. And I, if you have access to it, heartily recommend that you see it. So as you saw, in the summer of 2014, Kara Walker had a massive exhibit uh, at the Domino Sugar Factory in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, which isn't too far from where I am right now. And the name of Walker's exhibit was A Subtlety for short. And the longer name is, or the marvelous sugar baby, an homage to the unpaid and overworked artisans who have refined our sweet tastes from the cane fields to the kitchens of the new world on the occasion of the demolition of the Domino sugar refining plant. And in the video we saw and possibly felt the scale of that project, especially when you look at the Sphinx, the sugar Sphinx, and then the small children, uh, and also the color contrast, right? Like the big white Sphinx, and then the children kind of co further colored in black with sugar that she put all over them. And you hear from Kara Walker and also her contemporaries about the reactions to this work, how those on the outside, air quotes, uh, may find this entertaining, whereas those who see it as a replica feels on a deeper level and comprehend the residence of what we think when we consider the way the black body was used to bring about white wealth. So as historians and scholars noted, community is not a monolith. And yet we do need to acknowledge that the experience of Walker's work, for example, has a very potent effect. And that's her intention too, right? And as David Driscoll, another historian artist in that video said, the need to for freedom to do their project is imperative. So what kind of awareness is Walker bringing when you see, look upon this figure? 
especially seeing her in contrast to the figure, right? Um, what do you not know about what's going on and what starts to kind of come to your mind as you experience the way that the people were experiencing it in the video, the kind of looking, panning around and seeing the figures around the Sphinx and, and looking at the, sh the way the, sh the sugar is all over the space. Like what kind of experience do you get from that just watching it or looking upon this photo? And does it change things for you? Does it change your perspective? Does it change again, bring about a certain awareness that makes you think a bit more deeply about what can be happening or what intentionality is coming from the author, the art artist, or what the use of sugar to talk about slavery? How do you how it how's this like coming into your mind if if you're kind of like really really absorbing this? It's it's deep. It's pretty deep and. and it's part of what I love about art is that sometimes from our perspectives, we're, we may not really realize how deep we're going into a subject matter or, or what that actually does to us when we consume it. So here we have much more light, much more vividness and contrast, right? So on my left is a portrait from Kahinde Wiley, and on my right is a portrait from Amy Sherald. And they're also in the Black Art documentary you just saw a clip from. And they became bigger household names when they did the respective portraits of Barack Obama and First Lady Obama. And if we look at these examples of their work and their distinctions and their portrayals of Blackness and femininity and regality, Light and the importance of it is spoken a lot in the documentary Black Art. And the need for light against the darkness is also symbolic of perspective. So if we have the light or the opportunity to be in the spotlight to convey our art and ourselves, how is that part of building awareness through a lot wider lens of, avail of visibility? And when we no longer are pushed aside to cater to others' narratives or how or how do we mold those that give full expression in life to about bringing about more consciousness, be it of individuals or regions or in contrast to the fallacies that are presented to us? To me, the power of art is in making us see things differently. And I think that really inherently ties into how we think. Um, so how I, I now view the world, especially being in isolation, right? is very, very different than I viewed it two years ago this time, right, in 2019. And maybe I have a wider lens now because of my experiences, um, but maybe I'm absorbing art in a very different way. Maybe I'm taking in stories in a very different way. And when I look upon these two particular images, which I chose for a reason, uh, I, I really love the vibrancy of them. And I got to see the, the Herald one, the one on my right, in person and it is just so dynamic of, of and you know it's full size and she puts things eye level so that you're actually looking at the person and you know you're like eye to eye to the person rather than looking up or looking down at them you know there's just like this eye level thing and, and again intentionality what does it mean to actually look at a person in the eye and look at this kind of portraiture and have someone looking at you at a profile kind of slyly and things like that you know it it, it makes you see people, I think, in a bit more humane way. Uh, and not to say that I wouldn't have seen these two individuals in a humane way, but I think it, it recasts something for some people, right? When you actually just sit and absorb it and really take it in and the scale of it and the colors and, and what it's beside or what's not when you just have nothing around it. So last weekend, Scholar, poet, and now comic book writer, Eve L. Ewing wrote an op-ed in the New York Times about the racist vitriol that she's experienced now that she's part of the Marvel Universe writing the Ironheart comic. And this is a quote on the screen. Per Ewing, superheroes reflect our shared cultural mythologies, what it means to be good, to be courageous, to face unbeatable odds. But superheroes represent something beyond that. 
It's not only that if a little black girl sees Ironheart being brave, they will understand that they can do the same thing because they look like her. It's that superheroes serve as a shared cultural mirror, paragons of what bravery even is. So the importance of Ironheart and many superheroes is that the depiction of courageousness is for the individual, right? Especially when it concerns the protection of one's community. That's usually what's happening in these superhero ones is like they're protecting a larger swath of people from something that's like just an evil entity, a designated evil, right? And, and so that's a greater mission for a superhero is being a savior of sorts. But what does it mean to see yourself as the one doing the saving and not solely the one needing to be saved? Inherently, there's a level of complexity and humility that is also required for us to really embrace and relate to anyone, let alone superheroes who are not infallible. But it is also in the kind of larger weaving of the story of someone who is trying to be selfless, um, but also in the complexity of what does that mean? And is selflessness really as kind of one note as we might think it is? Maybe it's not. And those are things that Eve L. Ewing is actually trying to really delve into and to delve into it with more characters that are black and brown rather than kind of the pervasive white saviorism. What happens when we mix it up a lot more? So what ways can art motivate empathy as a creative form? And on top of that, how does activism help inform to also incite empathy along with awareness. Well, for that, let's seg into activism for a little bit, right? Activism. 1917, East St. Louis, Illinois. So I don't know how many people have heard about the East St. Louis massacre. And this occurred from July 1st to July 3rd. So again, more than 100 years ago. And this was four years prior to the Tulsa Race mac Massacre. Uh, and we're approaching the centennial for that, sadly. Um, so tensions increased as more Black people migrated from the South for jobs. So migrated Illinois, came North, Pacific, Northwest, all that stuff. And in this particular city of East St. Louis, uh, the Black population had about doubled in the span of less than a decade. So earlier in 1917, white workers went on strike at one of the big aluminum factories within the city. Who replaced them? Black people. That didn't go over well. This along with unfounded rumors of black violence on white citizens fueled the fire and led to a rash of random attacks of the black population. So in June, the National Guard had actually been called into the county to try and settle things. But about a month later, on July 1st, reportedly, a white man in a Ford just started shooting into Black people's homes. Protecting themselves, armed Black citizens shot at an oncoming Ford. Again, that is the car that the first reported shooter had been in. And so seeing another Ford, they thought, oh, this is the same guy. Uh, it turned out it was two police officers coming to investigate what was going on. And unfortunately they were killed. The next morning, a full on race war happened and white people collectively beat black people and took to burning their homes. And more violence took place in other areas of the city as well. And much of this is recorded in the crisis that I had mentioned earlier when we talked about the, the Harlem Renaissance and you know, so this is on record, you can look it up if you wanna learn more about it. So just to be clear, United States massacres have preserved white supremacy. They are meant to limit, if not eradicate the rights of marginalized individuals. And these massacres continue to this day, be they by groups or by solitary persons. Several weeks after what happened in East St. Louis, um, the New York City, specifically, I believe Harlem branch of the NAACP said, started putting up flyers and spread the word that they, there was gonna be a silent protest. This happened July 28th, 1917, as mentioned. And 
via the NAACP flyer, one of the lines was, we march because we deem it a crime to be silent in the face of barbaric acts. So 10,000 Black people, adults and children marched, I believe, I don't know if it was up or down Fifth Avenue, but it was along Fifth Avenue of that day. And it was reportedly a hot day too. Um, the aims of the protest were to encourage the Woodrow Wilson administrative administration to support policies helping black people. And unfortunately that meeting did not take place. Um, so while immediate federal support did not occur, the symbolic nature of, and the numbers of people who gathered really talk about the importance of showing up. And in a case like this, a silent protest, silence speak volumes. But speaking of silence and silencing, there are also those who want to erase the work already out there because there's a need to control the narrative. So this image is somewhat fuzzy, um, but it's a book burning in 1933, Germany, um, by Joseph, led by Joseph Goebbels. The work of Jewish authors and blacklisted American authors were set to burn. And Goebbels noted that the German man specifically would not be about books. It'd be about character. And that we would educate you. And the we meant those slipping into leadership positions, not earned leadership, they were taking it. Silencing isn't just about a form of removal of work. It's also about silencing of people. Enforced silence, versus chosen silence. Very, very, very big difference. So here you can see police officers or actually firefighters using high pressure fire hoses on black people during peaceful demonstrations in Birmingham, Alabama. And water wasn't the only way that this was done. When video started to circulate more at the time, it sparked outrage and you know, there was a firm chronicling of the violence that was like kind of on repeat, especially you know, once more TVs entered people's homes. And this encouraged more support for equality efforts. And sadly, it also encouraged more violence. And people might be very aware of the 1619 project that came out in 2019. And that will now be an anthology that's coming out later this year. And there's also gonna be accompanying children's books too. And for some people this stirred up a lot of stuff and people didn't appreciate that there was gonna be open discussion about enslavement and the recorded narratives of the first slaves. But the enormity of this project gained a lot of necessary attention, but it did encourage backlash from people who will not be named and those who wanted to create an alternative fact. And what those who will not be named desired was something more patriotic. That's used a lot, right? The term patriotism. In fact, what was proposed was something called patriotic education rather than one that was factually sound. And these are the ways in which reality can dictate art because if others' realities are not even part of an education or everyday learning, then how could they be received or even created when the basis for existence of this part art already presents it as fiction and or fallacy? So we got another video, last one, I promise. This one is of the late, great Toni Morrison. And I've spent my entire writing life trying to make sure that the white gaze was not the dominant one in any of my books. And the people who helped me most arrive at that kind of language were African writers. Chinua Chave, Bessie Head. Those writers who could assume the centrality of their race because they were Africans. And they didn't explain anything to white people. Those questions were incomprehensible to them. Those questions that I would have as a minority living in an all white country like the United States. But when I read um, 
the poetry of Cesar or the poetry of Senghor or the novels particularly, Things Fall Apart was more important to me than anything. Only because there was a language, there was a posture, there were the parameters. I could step in now and I didn't have to be consumed by or be concerned by the white gaze. That was the liberation for me. It has nothing to do with who reads the books. Everyone, I hope, of any race, any gender, any country. But my sovereignty and my authority as a racialized person had to be struck immediately with the very first book. And it was strange because in this country, many books, particularly then, uh, 40s, 50s, you could feel the address of the narrator over my shoulder talking to somebody else, talking to somebody once. I could tell because they were explaining things that they didn't have to explain if they were talking to me. Hmm. It was that. So this is a, it's profound for me. So that I may be, you may be right, maybe I'm over-dramatizing the whole question, which was innocent enough, because the problem of being free to write the way you wish to without this other racialized gaze is a serious one for an African-American writer. Very serious. We're at the home stretch, friend. You did it. <laughs> so does awareness equal action? I don't know. I don't know. If you've experienced the work that we've briefly discussed or others that I'll mention later in terms of artists that I'll recommend that people should follow, I, I don't know how that has actually affected you. But as an editor, as an author, as an instructor, I often ask, how does XYZ make you feel? What kind of response does it invoke when you read, touch, witness, hear something that may totally contradict what you've known or fills in a gap you weren't aware was apparent? Again, for me, I want to be changed after I experience something. And that can be minor. It can be on a huge, deeper level. It can be profound. But I feel like art in every sense is an experience for me. And so there, these are some questions that I ask myself. Am I an activist or an advocate or an ally or a community builder? Do I need to define myself or my work? I work in publishing, so in regards to work, we always find ways to define the work in order to sell the work, right? If we're looking at the capitalistic system. So if we think outside of that into the you know, organic nature of creation or the, or the nature of experience, you know, do we need to define that? And do we always need to know what that does? But what does it kind of invoke for us? And, and for me, I, I definitely consider myself a community builder. I, I think it's incredibly important for me to, to know who's around me to be more aware of the ways that I can cause harm and to know that even in the things I, not just in the things I say, but in where I spend my money and, and even how I present individuals on the page. And now that I'm acquiring books to actually bring out for consumption down the line, it is incredibly important for me to have a much more expanded awareness than I did last year, the year before that, the year before that. You know, every day I want to be a bit well, more well-rounded person. And that means expanding awareness. It means expanding knowledge. And to me, it means broadening community in a, in a re very real, real way. And, and so these are just questions I often ask myself. And they're questions, you know, that I might ask other people, not with the expectation, expectation of them to really be able to answer that. But for us to, again, start ruminating on what we wanna contribute and what we wanna put out there, what's important to us. And to speak to a little bit of my background, I'll stop sharing so you can actually see my face for a little bit. I recognize my own privilege and also comprehend that my blackness is not something I had to wallow in, in the stories I was creating. But I didn't 
realize that. So speaking to Morrison's point, when she was talking a lot about what she needed to consume and needed in order to be able to write from a very real place for her, from a place that really kind of represents who, not just who she is meant, like where she is mentally, but what she's experienced as, as a black woman and, and being in inherently black spaces. I personally, as a child of the eighties to the nineties, was not recognizing that I was perpetuating a lot of things that I was just absorbing. I, I didn't realize that in a very real way until way later when I was seeing how kind of there was a lack of depth to the stories I was telling. So these narratives of self weren't really of the self for me. They were really just regurgitation of a lot of what I was consuming. Um, again, 90s kids. So there's a lot of Ethan Hawke going on. <laughs> like a lot of Winona Ryder, uh, John Hughes. <laughs> like, so I was like writing these kind of stories. I was big into horror. So I was, you know, like Freddy Krueger was big for me. I, I watched the whole Nightmare on Elm Street series. So I was just kind of like, oh, I'm just going to put people that I know in these kinds of stories, but not really think a bit more about, well, you can't just like, you know, interchange people. You can't just take out Winona Ryder and then put like a black kid from Queens in that same space. It just don't work. It just don't work. So what are you bringing to that? Like what kind of differences and inherent ways that like community is seen and experienced are we kind of thinking about in these narratives of self? And a lot of people start saying today, like mirrors and windows, which Rudine Bishop came up with, you know, mir mirrors, windows, and sliding doors, I believe is the term from Dr. Rudine Bishop, right? And a lot of people say, I wrote for the people, my, the, the six, my 16 year old self and stuff like that. I don't, I, I don't look at it that way, particularly. And, and I think it's fine if people do, but I, I think I'm like, I'm seeking to talk about things that I think we're afraid to talk about and think about. And that's how I approach art now in, in terms of my creation of art. And also in terms of what piques my interest is I, I, I wanna know something different because I don't know everything. What I don't know fills the Grand Canyon. But like, what is my aim now? And maybe the aim is to write for a nine-year-old you. Or maybe the aim is to write for a 75-year-old you. Or maybe the aim is to write for people you've never even met. Uh, but to me personally, my aim for art is to, to make us have some, some real discussions. Uh, and, I, I, and it's not for the sake of discomfort. It's not, I wanna make people uncomfortable. It's, it's, and maybe it does just inherently does that, but I, I feel like we can have these conversations and we can grow from these conversations because I had to have a lot of uncomfortable th conversations in therapy, outside of therapy, recognizing that I was perpetuating harm as a cisgender, heterosexual person, an able-bodied person, realizing that I was using like offensive vocabulary, realizing that there were just things that I wasn't thinking about that I should have always been thinking about. So now that I'm thinking about it, how do I wanna approach this dynamic? How do I wanna talk about it? And in one story, it might be, you know what? Let me talk about, you know, um, homophobia within Black communities. Of uh, Maybe it's me talking about criminal justice in a different way of us, you know, if we always look at the law, what about those of us who support the law? You know, like what can we do on an individual basis? What, what does that really look like? Uh, what is my privilege giving me the opportunity to overlook? Um, what is being a Black person heightened for me? in terms of how I observe things. How, how does that raise my awareness in terms of like, now that I sit down and talk to someone who is transgender or non-binary or disabled, how, how does that influence my outlook if I'm really listening, if I'm really keyed into what they're saying and really hearing about what their experiences are and the way that they experience the world? Am I gonna start to kind of recalibrate of, well, what am I putting out in the world that might be harming me? And what, a, like, what am I doing that I can fix? Or maybe fix is the really wrong word that I can just be aware of and, and just monitor more so than anything else. And I take that very seriously as an artist and I've taken it incredibly seriously as an editor. And so that's, that's part of where how building our narratives 
how does that build awareness? I think inherently we start to become a lot more cognizant of who we are when we really are open to what expression means and the work that that entails. Because it's not fun work. It's not pretty at all. It's necessary. And I think it brings about the best work. Uh, you know, looking at Kara Walker's material, you know, she's talking about something. I can't imagine that's easy for her to create. I can't imagine that that doesn't do something to an artist to have to create things again in that way on that scale um, over years of time. You know, she doesn't do that over a week. That took years. That took months to do, to actually build it. But who knows how long it was percolating in her mind. Those things aren't easy, you know? And then to receive the criticism of people who don't get it or who and buy it and all that stuff. Like none of that is easy at all. So I will share my screen really quickly one more time because I want to suggest that you follow some of these amazing artists or look into their work. And if not read it, visualize it, all that good stuff. So they're authors, journalists, photographers, poets, love me some poets. Um, Titus Kaffar, who he won a MacArthur grant, uh, his, woof, his paintings are just, woof, just, you have to see them. I can't even describe them. They're just so amazing what, what he does. And, and it's, it's very potent. And it was kind of weird because I, I don't think he was in the black art documentary because I watched it a couple of times and I don't think, I think maybe his art might've been kind of swept over, but he wasn't in it, but he's a very amazing painter who does portraiture and, and really takes a different spin on it. It's really great. But Minjin Lee, Anjali Jetty, who Jessica also knows is amazing. Jasmine Ward and my lay, Alok Vaid Menon. Reginald Dwayne Betts, Shazia Sikander, Zane Jukhadar, Dawood Bey, Joy Harjo, Felita Hicks, Viet Tan Wen, Shelley Nero, and Titus Kafar. And again, these are just some artists. There are obviously billions around the world over that I think everyone should follow, but these are just some people I think, you know, again, they, they encourage really deep thought. And, and some of their stuff, you know, yes, it's entertaining, but it's also very informative how they do bring both together. You know, like Pashinko by Min Jin Lee. It's historical, it's character driven, it's beautiful. Um, they're just so many, so many amazing, wonderful artists. So I thank you so much for being with me this evening and for, you know, listening and for being open hearted, because, you know, that's a big deal too. And I really appreciate you sharing space with me and be allowing me to share space with you. I think that we can go to questions if anybody, we have a little time for questions. Who would like to kick that off? Uh, I'll take a digital hand or an actual hand. I am so crazy excited. Can I have a hand and a shout out? Uh -huh. uh, hello. Thank you so much, Jennifer, for that, that talk. I'm excited on so many levels, having lived in Greenpoint and Williamsburg and driven past. Oh, yay. I'm a New Yorker. You know, so many levels I'm in the arts, the subtlety, all of this, you know, Kara Walker following her career from when she was very, very young. I mean, yeah, just amazing. Um, I was wondering what you thought if you had seen you know, Sarah Lewis's talk maybe three, four years ago, I think it's a TED talk that she did about images shaping our understanding of justice. It's something I had not seen. I knew about her, but I kind of stumbled across it and you know, thinking about the image of um, Frederick Douglass and <clears throat> I, you know, I learned in that, which I didn't realize that he was the most photographed person in the United States in, uh, in his time, mm -hmm. any of anyone, more so than Lincoln or anybody, not the most photographed black man, but I was like image and images shaping justice. And I wonder what you thought about that. That may be a longer conversation, but anyway, I think you're amazing. Oh, thank you. It's so kind. Um, I, I, I'm going to have to watch that TED talk. But I, I, you know, that is a great question because 
again, I'm obsessed with museums. I always go to museums when I go to another state, city, country. I'm just like, let's go to the museum. But they're just like, what? <laughs> I'm just like, like, yeah, we can spend the day there. It's going to be amazing. Uh, and so for me, I, I'm always interested in kind of like archival, the way places archive things. And that's why I love museums, because I'm like, I feel like museums tell a story of what they want us to see, right? Especially tourists, because museums are kind of for tourists not necessarily for like people who are from the place, right? Um, so when I went to Singapore and, and when I went to Malaysia and I looked at the layout of, of how they actually talked about and what they actually presented in terms of their history and how, how it's organized and how it's curated in, for the experience of like, oh, you go up here and you go down there and then you experience this and da 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 and, and, I, 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 and I always kind of pay attention to to what they, what's biggest on display and then what you kind of have to really look at. And, and it makes me think about the ways that, you know, like you're saying, Frederick Douglass was the most photographed person. And I think about PR. <laughs> I constantly think about PR, <laughs> especially activism, especially when I was like learning more about like Rosa, why Rosa Parks was the person. <laughs> for certain things and not like Claudette Colvin you know it's like well why did they pick her and not her it's like PR PR oh my god and so I, I I'm always kind of like wondering what I'm not seeing too um Just super quick um it, it one of the things that Lewis says is that um it's not and I mean, I, I've worked in museums for 24 years and she says it's not that museums reflect culture I was like okay it's that images drive it they right. drive they drive the bus and I'm like okay my right. entire job is now rethought but anyway right. no that's right that's that's what it is too I mean I feel like the African-American museum is really like but that's like history and stuff but it's still driving it through what they chose uh, yeah. so I feel like you know when you kind of sit and really absorb like what the imagery is and actually like look at kind of the placards and describe what it is like I, I think it kind of builds awareness of, for me personally, of past and present for me. I, I really look at like the dates and like, oh, that's what that was like then. And, and then I start to think, trying to see it how it is now or how I think it is now. And so I kind of always juxtapose things when I look at imagery. Uh, that's just how my mind works in, yeah. in, in that regard, so. Dr. Ibrahim Begovic has a question, I believe. Thank you so much um, for your really interesting talk. Um, there's something that I'm sort of trying to work through in my head and it's something that really interests me. And, and I also thought that a lot of what you said is are things that I talk about in my narratives of the self classes at Oglethorpe. I, I just talk a lot about these cultural influences, how we're all a product of our culture. And we have to think about like, you know, where the self and the authentic, authentic self, I guess, starts, right? Like within all of that mess of advertisement, right? <laughs> Marketing, right? Um, and I just am so bothered. Um, Phyllis Wheatley's Christianity and the voice, the voice of like, for example, we teach Beloved and Toni Morrison and you have Christianity and then you have African, like, like ghosts of African, I missed and how those two blend together and to what extent is this an authentic new experience for African-Americans? Does, do I make any sense? Like for example, because Christianity was used as, it was part of the driving engine for the justification of slavery. And then you have Christianity used as giving hope to the enslaved people for them to gain their freedom and, and to, to, to find, re, regain their humanity that was taken from them. I don't know, do you have any, I mean, when, when, when Toni Morrison talks about her authentic voice as a racialized author, I just, I don't know. Any so thoughts? you're talking any a thoughts? little bit about assimilation and how that affects it? 
Yes, I think so. Okay, got it. Cool. I am not a religious person. My grandmother is very disappointed. So, <laughs> like, uh, yeah, technically, I come from Southern Baptists. Uh, so that was a big thing. And for some reason, the religion divide starts breaking up in, in my family. And, and so certain things that are like kind of very tethered to religion and like that, that symbolism, I don't always get like Updike, he uses biblical stuff a lot. And that would just kind of go over my head until I was in class. Uh, and I was just like, oh, I'm fine, huh? <laughs> they're, like, they're like, oh, there's always biblical talking. I was like, why don't you just say what you need to say? I don't know. And so I, yeah, I, I, I see, I know from my grandparents, being from the segregated South, they're in Aiken, Cal Aiken South Carolina. Church was really what bound them to community. Uh, and they, they were religious people, especially the women, uh, the elder women in my family. But that was really how they found community. And it actually kept them tethered to their community until their end, end of their lives. Um, and so I see how it, it molds too and it's utilized in a different way when you start getting into kind of like the secular nature of, of certain aspects of religion. Again, I'm ignorant into like the specifics of it, but I, I can just speak to how much it influenced and, and meant to my family. And, and I recognize that is also something that is enforced and, and then becomes modified for the way that cultures might be able to utilize that to come together and, and to find joy and, and to just find a level of stability and to find an outlet, which for me is art. My outlet is art. Theirs was church. Uh, and so, I, I mean, I don't know if that answers your question, but I, I do see the ways in which a, some for, enforced assimilation actually comes into it. And then that really does kind of make a do, different kind of aspect to our culture, I think. Um, and again, I'm not speaking for all black people. It's just like, really recognizing how much the church was huge, huge. And for some friends of mine who are my age and younger, the church is still very important to them. Uh, right, and so like the whole question of going back to Africa, for example, which I assume is a can of worms, is a moot question right now, right? Because we're new people here. We're definitely a new people. Do we have other questions? We are ready for that. I have one. I, maybe I should do the last one. What do you think, Sarah? Um, activism is hard. Art is hard. Both of these things are hard. And I really appreciate the list of who to read and who to watch and who to follow, as well as how to be active, You know how to contribute to your community. Um, but these things are all very hard. So how do we keep at it? How do you recommend that as artists and as activists and people who sometimes just need to Netflix and chill, mm -hmm. how, do we, how do we keep at it? How do we get back and do it the next day? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a great question. I, and you know, I was talking to someone who's trying to get into publishing, uh, a young woman in her early twenties, and I think she's getting, she's right out of undergrad in this regard. And she was raring to go. She like wants to get into publishing and change the world and change the industry. And she's just like, you know, I'm ready to, to do all the things and da, 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 da. And I said, well, maybe you should just learn the job. <laughs> I was just like, I was just like, literally, I was just like, like, like do you want to join all these committees and, and do all these fights and be, be, be the people's Latinx friend? And I was like, do you want to do all that? Or do you want to learn the job and then figure out what that means for you after that? And, and this was the phone, but then there was a pause. And I was just like, oh, it's, it's happening. The wheels are turning. <laughs> because I think people just, they think I can't not be active, but I'm right. always like, well, what does that mean? You know, you know, I don't go to a protest every week. I go to protests, but I don't go every week. I, I, I do not have the physical or mental capacity to do that every week. Um, my job in and of itself enforces capitalism. I'm not unaware of that. I, I know that. 
<laughs> you know, like, and at the same time, I'm also really focused on helping bring about the stories of Black people and bring about stories that I think are really, really important and really giving them the support as an editor and as a cheerleader, right? And that's right. one level of it, right? And then I do my podcast, which to me is about providing a community resource because I knew what was important to me, again, if you follow me on Twitter, is sharing information. I said, knowledge is power. If I share information, I don't want anyone to not be aware of how things work. So I'm accessible. People can email me. People can ask me things all the time. But I kind of had to make this boundary of this is what, what do I want to give to the community? And what is actually, phys what can I physically actually do? I can share information. I can be resource. Mm -hmm. I can find resources. I can, I can be that person. I can be a conduit in that way. Yeah. And then I can do my approach, I can make my donations. I can do, you know, this, I can teach, I can mentor, I can do other things within reason. But my main focus is always making sure that people who don't know what the art world is like, I want you to understand it. I want mm -hmm. you to be able to advocate for yourself. I want you to understand how this industry works. Yeah, because as artists, you need to know that because you come in and you might think something and then who knows what happens. And so that's my recommendation is this yeah. like, what is important to you? Like maybe it is being a boots on the ground organizer, in which case maybe put that's where your energies go. You know, and maybe it is just being an artist and, and figuring out what your art does. And maybe it is just being a cheerleader for other people. And maybe it is just building your community and working on yourself. Just like, just straight up, just work on yourself rather mm -hmm. than try to change the world. Mm -hmm. All of these things make differences. And I don't think people realize that. I right. think, yes, we need people at protest. And yes, we need people to vote. Please vote. Please vote. Yeah, do everyone vote. Let's, everyone vote. Yeah. <laughs> like, but, and we need all these things. We need all these things. You cannot do all these things. So yeah. what, what does that mean to you? What is important to you? And then focus on that, which is why I told that young woman, I was like, maybe focus on the job and figure out where you yeah. want to align yourself yeah. in the larger sphere of things. That's a great answer. That is an ideal answer. And I will take that to my classroom and to myself as well. It doesn't mean I always follow it. I, I have to admit, I'm just like, I'm going to be a beacon of wisdom. <laughs> Meanwhile, <laughs> you're being a be you're being a beacon of wisdom now. You can you can take like not do it tomorrow. Yeah, I like, haven't slept in two days. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, uh, thank you. This was great. This was fantastic. I turn it back over to Dr. Terry. Who will just bid you all adieu. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> thanks again, Jennifer, for sharing your time with us and your experience with us. Um, and I hope other students and faculty will benefit from it too, um, as we sort of curate our collection of oh, lectures wonderful. this year. Yeah. Thank you so much. I really appreciate everybody here. And Thank you. Just keep safe, everybody. Y'all take care. Bye. See ya. Bye.